All right. So progressive era vocabulary. Um, and the progressive era vocabulary starts with, um, with, with a, with one major word, which is reform. Um, and reform is the key to basically understanding this. Changing, uh, improvements, uh, changing for the better. Very simple definition, right? And down below uh, reform, you have progressives. Okay, these were the people that that uh, were significant in making these changes and these people that were looking for change, okay, making progress towards conditions. And the biggest thing was, uh, the biggest dynamic was the condition between employers and employees, okay. They advocated for better enlightened or more liberal ideas like, hey, I'm sick, I shouldn't go to work today. And of course, your boss wouldn't fire you for being sick. All right. Um, there's things like that uh, in workplace injuries. Uh, how much how much responsibility does a boss have or does a company have for your injury on the job? Um, there's all kinds of things like that that were looked at. How about children working? Um, how about um, issues of of um, uh, of of safe working conditions, okay? So like things like uh, uh, guards on moving objects and uh, fences and guardrails around dangerous parts of a factory, okay? Those were all like new ideas. We think, we think of it as normal today that you would put a fence or a guard over something that was dangerous, something that was sharp, but uh, no, it's not, it's not a new thing. So experimental methods, all kinds of things that would lead to the changes that um, that are going to happen. So, um, so that would be the beginning right there of the progressive. Then we, of course, we've got the progressive movement, which is what we're going to be looking at. Okay, on the opposite side and the conservative side, which would be the right side. Okay, remember the political spectrum that I have up front there. You've got the liberal ideas or progressive ideas on the left, and you've got more conservative ideas on the right. And if you look at those two little lines below there, the little lines that are crossing the center, um, you know, there's times where both liberals and conservatives meet at the center, meaning that they have a lot of similar ideas that are important to them. Um, like like work, workplace, workplace safety is something that both conservatives and, and liberals basically can have a consensus on. It, it helps to have a safe working environment. It also helps to have happy workers, you know. So there's a lot of things that they do agree on together. Um, there's another, if you look at a more modern issue like education, there's no doubt that conservatives and liberals both agree that education is an important uh, a component of our society being free and healthy, okay. so. Um, down here, you got the word liberal, and up on the word on the top here, you've got the word conservative. And what is conservative? Uh, people that like to adhere to the traditions, okay? Traditional methods, traditional values, uh, that kind of thing. Um, okay, down below that, you've got the progressive movement, which was the period of time um, that this movement takes place, okay? Um, during this time, you had all kinds of, of controls and, um, and, and um, the biggest thing is returning um, control back to the people. They believe, uh, many people believed that uh, control was taken by, by industry and it needs to basically be corrected. Uh, let's see, let's go down here. So here's a couple of different um, uh, different topics that kind of help us understand that muckrakers is one. A muckraker is a person that engages in the um, the investigation of and or the exposing of what they consider to be injustices. Okay. Um, muckrakers wrote things. They were photographers. They were newspaper reporters, um, and of course later on they would be radio. Uh, talk show people that would uh, that would be more modern version of it, and then eventually TV. But muckraker journalism are people that expose things, and you see a lot of that today. There's a lot of what they call muckraker journalism, okay? Um, and it comes from muckraker. Muck is basically a person that's cleaning up the mess. Um, I guess you want to look at it that way. 
a muckraker worked inside of a factory. Uh, usually, I believe that was like a food factory, and they cleaned up the mess, the spoils on the floor. Uh, regulation. Regulations are things that government use to control operations. So uh, a regulated business means that you can't just do anything you want. There are certain guidelines or regulations that you have to adhere to, okay? It says, uh, government controls placed upon operations of business and industry. Um, economic, political, and social. There were reforms that came in the form of economic, political, and social changes. They came in those forms. Uh, so when I, you see your word on your list, um, you see, let me click over there really quick, you see social reform, political reform, economic reform, same thing, okay? Economic reforms fixed um, the way the monetary system functioned. Um, you could say an economic reform was uh, was made when they uh, they they when businesses decided that it would be okay for them to pay people for days off, called paid leave. Um, now it's actually required that you get leave, but not necessarily paid leave. Some businesses give you paid leave because it's a it's a it's a nice perk. It's a nice incentive for employees. But the economic reforms have to do with money, trade, taxes, jobs, anything to do with business structure. Okay, political reforms have to do with ec uh, government structure. Okay, so the way government interacts. Um, so the list they give are uh, uh, rules for elected officials, uh, voting laws, and or anything within. Um, the political spectrum or government. Uh, at the very bottom are social reforms, okay, relating to people's safety, issues of health, uh, and people's well-being. So any of those things uh, would basically, uh, in any of those categories, you can use when you decide to make your project that you can use as your topic heading. You can go into there and I'll give you some specific areas that you can, some specific reforms that you can uh, focus on, okay? So those are the general topics of reform. So let's go down and look at some of those. Um, these are all, these are all uh, uh, political reforms here. Um, the idea of secret ballots, um, you get you get a you you have to reimagine a world where where people when they went in to vote kind of publicly voted they they either voted for one or the other and there was no secretiveness to it there was no security to it so you would go there and you wouldn't cast a blind bolt vote you would cast a public vote i vote for this candidate okay um, taking it and writing it on a piece of paper and making it confidential uh, was what they call the Australian ballot, okay? I have no idea where that word comes from. I'm sure there's a long story behind it. Um, probably not necessary for us at this time. The uh, next one is direct primaries. Direct primaries um, are, are basically the filtering system that filters out candidacy, okay? so. Um, for each big party. Uh, but prior to direct primaries, there would be a couple of Republicans running against each other and there would be a couple of Democrats running against each other in the general election. And what they did was they created the primary system so one side or the other or your political party can get the best and the most popular of your candidates. Um, we're gonna actually look at a, an election um, the, the election of, uh, was it 1910 I think it is? I can't remember what year. Um, and where Teddy Roosevelt would match himself, well, he's a Republican by the way, he would match himself against another Republican in the general election and since he couldn't because of the primary system, he had to create a third party. He had to create his own political party to run against the Republican he didn't like, okay? Um, so that's called a primary. So a primary election is an election that weeds out the candidates. So you're only getting a, a one party candidate and against another party a candidate. You're not getting multiple candidates from the same party. Um, when 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 President um, Nick, uh, Nick when President I was going to say Nixon when President Lincoln was elected, um, he was elected um, based on a split of the Democratic vote. Um, there was unity in the Republican Party, 
but there wasn't unity in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party probably would have won the election of 1860 if it wasn't for the split in the Democratic vote. Okay, there's a, there's a very famous story behind that election of 1860. But uh, um, Lincoln would win a majority vote because he was chosen by his party, the Republican Party, um, primarily. Even though people that didn't totally agree with Lincoln on certain issues still backed him to, because they didn't like the, the alternative. Uh, initiative and referendum, these go together. An initiative is basically um, a procedure where everybody, every one of you guys, when you become voting age, you can bring a issue um, to the public lawmaker, to public lawmakers, to, so you can get it looked at. Okay, so they call that an initiative. So say people drive too fast down your in your in your neighborhood, and you'd like the speed limit changed from 30 to 25. You would get a petition together, and that petition would go to the city council. Now, the city council could vote on it, or if it's popular enough, say there's enough people and there's enough of a, it's enough of an issue where the council doesn't believe that they should, it should go to what they call a general election or a referendum. That means that you put it to a vote. Um, and that's the, that's the biggest, you know, usually tax, tax issues. Um, say they're going to raise your taxes for something. They usually send that in as a referendum, and you'll see that initiative. So the initiative is just you bringing up an issue. And any one of you guys can bring up an, a, a, an initiative. You just got to get enough signatures on a, on a petition. Okay? The referendum is the actual procedure in which the legislative measure is submitted to a vote. Okay, a lot of times it doesn't get past the city council. Okay, sometimes it doesn't even get it gets it gets a proposed to the city council and it dies in, immediately because it's such a it's a gripe by five people and it's not something that a large amount of people in town really care about. Um, so initiatives and referendums are things that happen within at usually the state level or below. Let me go down here. Um, okay, we got lobbying, recall, settlement house, and suffrage. Okay, so lobbying or lobbyists is are people that have a special thing that they care about, and they want to get into the ear of politicians. So many times lobbyists will put up, set up an office in Washington, D.C., and they consistently talk to their Congress people and senators um, about what their constituents and a constituent is just somebody that is part of a lobby, okay? You're just a, a person that likes guns, okay, or has guns. And the lobby is the NRA, okay? That's a good example. The National Rifleman's Association has a huge lobby, a very, very powerful lobby, okay? And their constituents are basically the gun owners themselves, okay? So that's how that kind of works together. So how does a lobby work? Well, they get in your they get in the in the in the uh, the ear of the congress people and they t attempt to sway their opinion by constantly bugging them, okay? They say, "Hey, we have a lot of voters and you can actually be reelected as a congressperson if you support or if you support our ish the things that we we want." Like uh, more less stringent gun laws would be an example, and you would basically go to your as a lobbyist to those Democrats and Republicans and say, "Hey, you want a friend? Okay, then support our issues, and all of the people that have guns in America are going to vote for you." Okay, so that's that's a lobby. A recall is when you have a an elected official that you do not agree is doing their job and you want to get rid of them. And usually a recall election, only, it's basically, it's based on, uh, a ba recall elections work within a state and they work at the local level. And it's a, it allows you, it's other than an impeachment. The impeachment is, a, uh, is the opposite of, uh, not an opposite, it's just another version of a recall. You can't recall a president, for example. Um, so how do you deal with a, uh, a government official that, um, that is not functioning in, in to, the, to the will of the people, okay? And what they do is they just put them up for a second election 
Um, there's a lot of special election issues. Like if, a, if an elected official dies in office, you have to replace them with somebody. And they use, sometimes have a special election. But a recall election is when you're trying to remove somebody. And you're like, all right, based on the evidence, are you still going to vote for this person? And they'll have a recall election. And you can either vote them back in or you can vote them out. Uh, settlement house and suffrage, this has to, uh, these have to do with other special interest groups and settlement houses that it primarily deals with new people in the country, immigrants. Um, settlement houses were created by, by private individuals to help to settle people coming in. Usually those private individuals cared about a specific ethnic group that they belonged to, like Irish people or, uh, or people that were uh, from the uh, UK or people that were from Germany or Italy or wherever you're from. Uh, so settlement houses were a system of, of halfway houses between you, your mother country that you're basically emigrating from and entering the United States. It just gives you a place to, to start apartment building like best way to describe it um, probably shared a bathroom you probably lived with other families in the same in a same large room and of course your goal was to get out of there get jobs and and usually the settlement house people the people that ran it um, some of them uh, some of them had a specific goal in mind of where and what businesses you would get uh, you maybe get hired to but it was a, a halfway house last one is suffrage <clears throat> Um, suffrage is just the right to vote, right? And when we add women to the, to the front of suffrage, women's suffrage, you basically have women's right to vote or gain, women gaining the right to vote, okay? So that's suffrage. I don't know why that word suffrage is, is used because it just, it's one of those words that doesn't compute. Um, but once you learn it, it does. So once you hear it enough, so suffrage, the right to vote. And we'll look at women's suffrage. Now, if we want to look at a progressive issue, women voting, that was a huge progressive issue. It changed everything in America. It doubled the voting population. Think about it. When only men voted, you had half of the country voting. Now that women are allowed to vote, you, add, you double the voting population. Now you're going to have to bring up issues that women care about. Do you see why the right to vote is so important? You have to appeal to women. You have to appeal to their voting preference, okay? All right. Uh, Bull Moose Party. Um, let me go look at our list here. So we're getting down, <clears throat> down here. Um, the Bull Moose Party was created by Teddy Roosevelt. And there's a name, there's a reason why the name Bull Moose came out. And I'll show you a picture really quick here. It's kind of a famous picture. It's kind of fun. One of my favorite pictures. I really like Teddy Roosevelt. He's just one of those people that you just can't not can't be anything but uh, like. He's anything but likable, <laughs> not likable. But this is the this is a picture of Teddy Roosevelt um, on a moose um, in riding across the river. It says, "You may be cool, but you'll never be Teddy Roosevelt riding a moose cool." So that's kind of that's kind of neat. Um, that's kind of a neat picture. Um, but he was an outdoors person, um, and he names his political party the Bull Moose Party. So we'll go across here. Um, so why did he create his own political party when he was a Republican? Well, I kind of told you that. He he was kind of he was kind of estranged from his party when he left office, um, and he had the opportunity to become president again. He uh, he succeeded. He succeeded um, um, uh, President Harding, who, or excuse me, President McKinley. I, I may mis, 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 misspoke there. He succeeded President William McKinley, who was assassinated in office. Um, so, you know, being the vice president, he, of course, is the second in line uh, for succession. So he becomes president. So Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, rides out the, the term of McKinley, and then he's reelected after he finishes McKinley's term. So McKinley's term does not count as a presidential term. He's basically finishing another president's term. He has to be confirmed, though. Of course, the Senate confirmed him. Um, and then finally, when he, after his, his election, when he was up for reelection, 
he decides to not run. Um, and he allowed his friend, William H. Taft, to run in his place, okay? And he got angry at President Taft because President Taft started to do things that he didn't agree with. And that really changed um, the, the Republican Party. So we'll look at that. And once again, it split the vote of the Republicans. So, you know, because any Republican that liked Teddy Roosevelt voted for Teddy Roosevelt. Any Republican that wanted to stay on the Republican ticket and vote for Taft voted for Taft. But what happened was neither of them went win because they split the Republican vote, the Democrats are unified, and you get t uh, a Woodrow Wilson elected president in 1912, I believe. It's the election of 1912. Yeah, there it is. Duh, it's up there. So, But that's, uh, that's an attempt by Theodore Roosevelt to return to office. Yeah, a former president can return to office if he still has a term open. Okay. Um, can Barack Obama return to office? No, he served out a full two terms. Can uh, William Jeff Jefferson Clinton return? No, he can't. He f served out two full terms. Could George H.W. Bush, no, Herbert Walker Bush, it would be his dad. Now, President Bush, the younger one, he actually did serve two terms, but his dad only served a single term. But his dad is no longer with us, so there's no way he could do that. Um, Jimmy Carter um, is still alive. He's actually the only, the oldest former president that's still alive. He only served one term. He could actually run for president again. Yes, sir. If a president was impeached, could they run for a term? And good question. I, I don't think so because they were in a term. Yeah, they had already been serving a term when their impeachment happens. Yeah, I, I, I would. I'm going to check that. That's one of those. Law, those. That's one of those rules you have to. You'd have to look into the, the fine print on. But I believe no. I think if you're impeached, you basically lose that term. You could be kicked out. Well, I always check the no because. Plus, you committed a crime. Yeah. And I think that makes you, a felon, and now you can't become president because you have a felony. I don't think if you have a felony, you can you can run for office. So. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, what is a yeah? What is an impeachment too? That's a good question. Is that a felony offense? Uh, it's definitely a high crime. Okay, you're right. So interesting, interesting. That's a good question, by the way. Okay, um, but yeah, let's move on. We'll finish it up now. That's the last of these words. Let's just make sure we get through the last little bit. These are pretty easy. We've got square deal. I just brought these in because they're ideas that come within that time. So we have square deal program. Pure Food and Drug Act, Upton Sinclair, these are two people, and then Teddy Roosevelt. We already talked a little about Teddy Roosevelt, okay? President of the United States. He's the, if you look at the progressive era, he is kind of the poster child of the progressive era presidents, okay? All right. Um, Taft was not a progressive. Anyway, uh, that's not true. He did do some progressive stuff because he succeeded Roosevelt, but he was no near as progressive as as Roosevelt. He was definitely more conservative. We'll get back. Okay. Um, and you can see I don't have Taft's name on here because we really don't need to know his name, even though he's one of my favorite presidents. Uh, Taft is not only a likable guy, um, he's actually one of the most brilliant presidents that we've ever had, even though he was probably one of the most lazy presidents we've ever had. He hated to be president. He did not want to be president of the United States. So we'll bring that story up. He wanted to be chief justice of the Supreme Court. He was a, he was a lawyer that wanted to be a judge. Um, so he, the best, the, the, the highest judgeship you can get on the land is not only to be a member of the U.S. Supreme Court, but to be the, the chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. is It's like being president and having another, the second coolest job in the world, all, all in the same lifetime, which is amazing. So he had to be pretty smart. Um, but he was a super lazy president. We're talking like the guy who gets up uh, way late in the day, uh, missed cabinet meetings. Um, he uh, way liked to party it up and overeat too much. Um, he would rather play golf than be president. Um, he did all kinds of things other than do his job. Um, but he was he still got his job done. Um, and you could ask his wife how that got done, and she would say, well, I nagged him every day of his life because, you know, he needed it. And literally his wife kept him 
probably his wife might even be the uh, might have been actually more of a president than he was. But we'll look at her too. So she's kind of an interesting character. Um, so your Square Deal program. This was uh, this program here was Teddy Roosevelt's program to 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 make it the, the country better. So instead of make America great again, he says I'm going to give you a square every American a square deal. What does that mean? Fairness, right? Yeah. He believed in fairness to the utmost. Um, he neither sided with business totally or workers. He didn't pick a side. He stayed in the center, and he fought on either uh, on both issues. Okay. Um, at, at times, he came down for the side of the worker, um, but most of the time, he came down on the more, the most important side, the American people in general. He didn't believe that every that one group should be more um, more given more attention than another. Very interesting, a very a very important kind of thought if you think about being president. Um, and a Pure Food and Drug Act is actually one of the first progressive reforms that became something that was a, stead, a, a, a steady, powerful um, law that still uh, is uh, enacted today. The, Upton Sinclair was a muckraker journalist. He basically brought up issues that he thought American people, the American people needed to know. For example, where your meat came from. <laughs> he did an investigative report and then he wrote a book. Uh, he did a lot of articles about what was going on at the sausage factory. <laughs> so when you're getting your meat products, you knew you were either getting quality food or not. So uh, part of his job was to, to help pass the Pure Food and Jug Act, which is what Upton Sinclair exposed, which was, you know, hey, they were dumping trash and there was rat feces and food and all kinds of stuff like that. Pretty gross. Uh, last one is Teddy Roosevelt himself. So, of course, he was the quintessential, we'll call it, progressive president. Okay, so that's our list, guys. That's it. That is our list of things. Um, just make sure you have an, a, what I call a, just a simple, uh, just a uh, concise, um, just, you know, as, as brief as you can, uh, definition for each of those words. All right. Sweet. Very good.